promises bought and sold. A commitment made today concerning the future, our future. The Chicago Board of Trade, bringing together people and promises. Chip Wickens is a speculator. What we're doing is we're trading futures here. We're trading contracts that are going to be delivered in the future. Futures contracts are promises, commitments to buy or sell a commodity. Commodities can be products like wheat, corn, or soybeans, the grains that make our bread and cereal, or financial instruments like gold, silver, or bonds, tools that help to determine the value of our money. My bread and butter basically comes from what I do during the day. It's being an entrepreneur. Your entire livelihood is on the line. And uh, my biggest risk, biggest fear, is going broke. And that's a possibility every single day. But Chip takes this risk because he usually makes a fair profit on his trades. Like most people in this market, he doesn't intend to take delivery of the product. He has no need for thousands of bushels of soybeans. In fact, very few actually take delivery because most use futures contracts as financial tools to help them manage money and hopefully to make a profit. Joy Red is a hedger. She trades for a food processing company that uses tons of grain. Well, we've definitely been the best buyer today. Commercial grain companies are accumulating so much grain, and the flat price exposure is so tremendous that they need to offset that risk. Using futures, hedgers like Joy can predict the cost of the grain they'll use. Even Joy doesn't usually take delivery of the contract she buys. Joy is buying and selling a promise, which is the daily work of hedgers like Joy, speculators like Chip, and brokers like Paul Johnson. My customers are all over the world, in Amsterdam, and London, New York, Japan. From the location that I have, I can see all of these pits and will uh, pass the information on to my customers so that they're able to trade them. For that service, my customers pay me a commission. It's through brokers like Paul that customers buy and sell in this market. Jerry Gulke is a customer. He buys and sells on the futures market using a broker. Jerry raises corn, soybeans, and wheat on 2,000 acres of land near Rockford, Illinois. I think the main advantage we have as farmers is that we can uh, get up in the morning and make one phone call and literally sell 100% of our production for that day and lock in, a, lock in that price, uh, given the, the market conditions that we feel are, are right for us. I know of no other industry that uh, has that privilege or, or that uh, right. I spend approximately $250,000 to $300,000 on seed, fertilizer, and chemicals and land costs uh, to plant my crop. I began planting in late April and early May, really not knowing what kind of outcome I'm going to have come fall at harvest time. The main worries that, that I have is, is weather. This year was an exceptional year. The rains came and just never, never left. If there was a day to plant, we had to run pretty much till we dropped in the field. And finally, about the middle to late June, we finished planting uh, two to three weeks later than normal. In June, while he was still planting, Jerry sold a contract for 5,000 bushels of grain on the futures market. A futures contract is a legally binding agreement to buy or sell something in the future. In this case, his soybeans. This contract will help him manage the risks he faces, such as flooding, drought, insects, the unpredictability of nature, and what that could mean to his crop. Jerry calls his local broker to place an order to sell a contract for 5,000 bushels of soybeans. That broker calls the order into the exchange. Then a clerk takes the order. It's passed to a pit broker by a runner. The pit broker looks for another trader who wants to buy a contract for soybeans. A speculator buys it with the hope that the price of soybeans will go up so he can sell this contract later on and make a profit. The order is written up. The completed sale is reported to Jerry's broker who sends Jerry a fax confirming the price for his soybeans. Because the Board of Trade Clearing Corporation backs up every trade, Jerry can feel confident. Since 1925, no customer has lost money due to a default on a futures position. Jerry has now hedged his crop. 
This is a market transaction that's very different from how most of us buy and sell things. For example, we might buy a home and then sell it years later at a profit. But Jerry first sold his contract before anything existed, and then he bought it back later when the crop was ready to harvest. Suppose Jerry sold his soybeans at $1.50 per bushel in the spring. By fall, the futures price has dropped to $1 per bushel. Jerry buys back his soybean contracts, which gives him a 50 cent per bushel profit, a total of $2,500. He profits if he sells high and buys low. If I have a, a price that I feel is uh, sufficient, giving the market conditions, I can hedge the grain, sell on the futures, and lock in a profit. His profit, or even his loss from the futures market, offsets the price Jerry gets when he sells his grain to the elevator operator. Futures help me stabilize the price I receive from my products I grow. The world is, is filled with risk. We take a risk every time we step out outside our door. Some of those that we can prevent, some of those we can't. The futures help me pass off the price risk uh, to someone else. In essence, it's kind of like an insurance policy that locks in a price and prevents the, me from losing from that point on. Futures markets are driven by hedgers, customers like Jerry Golke, and traders like Joy Ritt. I grew up in Milwaukee. I had no idea about anything that went on in agriculture. I never thought about agriculture. I never thought about how food got to the table. I just took for granted that it was going to get there. I was intrigued by trading, and so got into agriculture that way. I love being a part of the Board of Trade. Trading futures can be very stressful, but there's a level of excitement that I truly enjoy. Both the farmer and the grain company, like the one Joy works for, want to stabilize and predict their prices. But just as important as hedgers, the market is also driven by speculators. Speculators take on the risk hedgers bring to the market. They can profit on price differences. It doesn't matter if they buy or sell first, as long as they buy low and sell high. Basically, I wanted to be a veterinarian and couldn't quite get through second year chemistry. So I decided that uh, economics um, was what I wanted to do. I get in early and I do my homework at 6 in the morning and have a general idea of what I want to do in the market and then we come down and the bell rings and what I try to do is buy or sell commodities and try to make a profit by the end of the day. The benefit of the Chicago Board of Trade is there are so many participants. If you want to buy, someone's here to sell. If you want to sell, someone's here to buy. It's this dynamic interaction of speculators and hedgers that allows for price discovery. Price discovery has historically been a key purpose of the board. The oldest and largest futures exchange in the world, the Chicago Board of Trade was founded in 1848. A group of merchants had the idea of creating a central marketplace that would resolve some pressing issues of that time. Close to the fertile farmlands of the Great Lakes, merchants faced crippling problems in managing supply and demand. At harvest time, Chicago's streets and waterways were choked with loads of grain as farmers went from merchant to merchant seeking the best price for their crops. Often, more grain was brought into the city than could be sold. Disappointed farmers were forced to abandon their crops due to the lack of adequate storage facilities. Often, as the grain spoiled, it was dumped into Lake Michigan. Prices for grain products fluctuated drastically during this period. Immediately after each year's harvest, when there was an abundance of grain, prices for bread and other grain products were low. Then, in late spring and early summer, when the harvest stocks had been depleted, prices rose sharply. The Midwest was desperately ready for a better way of doing business. And by 1865, the futures contract as we know it today was the standard for trading grain. The only part of the contract not standardized was the price. What evolved was a process called open outcry. Although it may look chaotic, it is the most efficient method of determining prices. Price discovery is finding out what things are worth. It happens every time a buyer comes to an agreement with a seller. What you have is basically everyone with their input deciding whether to buy or sell, and it all funnels down into the pit. Supply and demand play an important role in price discovery. 
We had this flood, we had the drought, but you had both sides of the market deciding it was too high priced or not, you know, not priced enough. And they're able to go forward and it's able to keep prices, general consumer prices, within a standard. If this was not here, it'd be tremendous fluctuations up and down, back and forth. The flood impacted the markets in a number of different ways. First of all, the rain in general delayed planting. We lost a lot of acres, so that takes production way down. With late planting comes late development. And we're watching weather all around the world 365 days a year. That's a major input for our markets. If supply is affected anywhere in the world, it certainly has the potential to affect prices. Demand is a big issue in our world right now with the changing politics, changing government, changing economic situations around the world. And that's why the Chicago Board of Trade is so important. As the largest futures market in the world, this is where speculators and hedgers converge to discover the real price of a commodity to protect their investments in the future. Futures contracts are traded for commodities that range from grains such as soybeans, wheat, and corn to financial products such as treasury bonds, 10- and 5-year notes, gold and silver. Financial futures were an innovation added to the exchange in 1975. Using financial futures, hedgers can avoid the effect of interest rate fluctuations on products, like mortgages. Paul Johnson helps these hedgers execute trades. Growing up, I used to come to the visitor's gallery here and thought it was always exciting watching the, the traders on the floor waving their arms, uh, trading the various commodities. Of course, back then, there were only agricultural products, and today we have the, the financial markets. But it was something that was in the back of my mind, even as a child, uh, though it took some 24 years for me to finally get uh, into the business. Today, Paul works with investors and portfolio managers throughout the world. Sell five D's bonds at the market? Yeah, I'll, I'll hold. Pete Taglia of Midwest Mortgage is one of the customers who regularly communicates with brokers on the exchange floor. Like Joy and Jerry, he's a hedger. Pete uses treasury debt futures to lock in interest rates. As a mortgage banker, we're giving commitments to people to buy homes. Someone will come in, they'll pick out a, a house of their dreams, they'll need a mortgage. Let's say that mortgage is $100,000. What we do is we commit to the person, we give them the right to have a certain interest rate. If I make a commitment to you to originate a mortgage, I have to be able to sell that mortgage and get back all my funds. Bottom line is, if I can hedge more effectively, what does it mean to you? It means I can give you a lower rate on your mortgage. So that, that hits you right where it counts. I need to pass on information. That may be from what's happening all over the world as we talk to people in, in different markets, but also to let people know what's happening on the, on the floor in front of me and to execute those trades. With the Board of Trade, people are able to pass on risk, therefore keeping interest rates lower. When you're watching people on the exchange floor, they're either buying something or selling something. An easy way to remember it is when you're buying something, you're bringing it towards you and your palms are in. When you're selling, you're pushing it away. The way the traders are able to tell the quantities that they're trading are by going to their head for hand signals or using their arms in various ways. It may look on the floor as though there are a lot of uh, people waving their arms crazily. It's actually very efficient. People know exactly what they're saying to each other. For instance, I'm flashing that into my broker in the pit who's immediately looking to a hundred different people to sell that hundred lot to. And as he does, immediately turns back to me to let me know. So in a matter of a couple of seconds, I've sold a hundred bonds probably wondering why I'm wearing this crazy colored jacket. Well, one of the things that we need to do on the trading floor is be noticed. If you're not noticed by people, you'll sort of stand off in the dark. And if you can't have somebody pay attention to you, you can't get your orders executed. This badge is what we use to identify ourselves on the floor. Traders will pick out letters that are personal to them. When traders trade with each other, this acronym is what they write down for the, on the opposite side of a trade so that when they take their cards up to the clearinghouse, they know who they traded with. While larger contracts are traded on the Chicago Board of Trade's agricultural and financial markets, members can also trade on the Mid-America Commodity Exchange using smaller contracts. They also have the added advantage today of instruments such as options, which give them the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell futures contracts at a later date.
Yet no matter the commodity or the size of the contract, accurate pricing and reduced risk taking in this market translate into greater price stability in your market. New technologies that enhance the open outcry system now allow us to move from one financial center to another. The benefits of futures exchanges reach every sector of the world, including nations where market conditions create frequent price changes. Around the world, around the clock, the business day never ends. Every person here serves a vital function in the economic well-being of our society. To you, that means a better life, a healthier world economy, a window on your future.